FSN Radio. It's all about what's next. Go to FinancialSurvivalNetwork.com and sign up for your free weekly newsletter. You'll also get three free reports. The Financial Survival Network. It's all about what's next. Welcome, and you are listening to the Financial Survival Network. I'm Kerry Lutz. It's 12, 11, 18. Well, a year is rapidly approaching. Then a monumental, in many ways, a transitional year. You'll see what I mean a little later. Hey, as always, be a part of the show and email us, kl at kerrylutz.com. So crime, we've seen these mass murders. They keep going on, although thank goodness, knock on wood, we haven't seen one in a while. But our good friend, John Arlott, is with us of the Crime Prevention Research Center. You can find his work, and I read it regularly, at crimeresearch.org. John, welcome back to the show. Oh, thanks for having me on. As always, so we've, we've seen that all of these mass shootings take place in gun-free zones, and gun-free zones are only gun-free for the people who would like to, uh, if you'd like to defend yourself, then it's gun-free. But if you're a criminal, then all bets are off. Well, I mean, these criminals may be, these killers may be crazy in some sense, but they're not stupid. <laughs> they know they want to kill as many people as possible. And they know that the longer it takes for someone with a gun to arrive at the scene, the more people that they're going to be able to go and kill. And, uh, uh, you know, so they realize that if they go to a place where people aren't able to go and defend themselves, they're going to be able to kill a lot more people. And so uh, they consciously, time after time, when you find discussions and diaries or other statements that these killers have left, try to go to those places where they don't have to worry about somebody uh, being able to stop them with a gun. Mm. Yeah, well, I mean, it's when you think about it, it's perfectly logical, isn't it? Uh, you know, you want to go do what you're going to do here. You don't want anyone to get in the way to stop you from it. And, uh, of course, you'd rather be where there's uh, unarmed uh, civilians than where there could be a large portion of them, uh, a large portion of you carrying a concealed weapon, right? Right. Well, I mean, uh, you know, it's one thing for police to carry. It's, it's, but it's important when you have... Um, civilians, general civilians, be able to carry. I mean, police, I think, do a great job and are important in many things, but they have an extremely difficult job when you're talking about stopping these types of mass public shootings. The terrorists, in these cases, have huge strategic advantage because, um, you know, by picking the time and the place for the attack. But if, if you have an officer there, or at least somebody who's readily identifiable as a guard, whether they're in uniform or identifiable for some other reason, you know, uh, uh, they're going to be the first people killed. Uh, it's yeah. kind of like having somebody there with a large neon sign that says, shoot me first, because if, uh, uh, if the killers can kill that person first and they are the only person with a gun, then they essentially have free reign to go and kill other people. Yeah, and we've seen recently where there have been so-called good guys with guns <clears throat> who have uh, who've been able to successfully intercede and stop the carnage. Oh, yeah. No, we have, if you go to our website at crimeresearch.org, we have lists of dozens of attacks in recent years that have been stopped by civilians with permanent concealed handguns that... Um, you know, it, it's amazing how little publicity these types of things get. I mean, you have very dramatic cases. Uh, sometimes it's even on video. But I have thought for sure, well, if it's on video, I'll be able to surely get this to get national media coverage. But uh, the media hasn't been interested. I mean, uh, one of the comments that I've gotten is that if they go and they give this coverage, then that would just be political. And, but, you know, if the person hadn't been there to go and stop the attack, uh, and pe many people have been killed, 
uh, it would have gotten national or international news coverage. And here you have somebody who you think is a hero uh, that would be interesting to give some coverage to, be newsworthy, but uh, it's not viewed that way. Well, if it goes against their memes and it goes against their political agenda, it doesn't matter what it is. Uh, you could be walking on water, uh, the first person to do it in a couple of thousand years, and uh, if it doesn't fit with uh, their anti-Christmas theme, uh, then forget it. It's not happening, right? Right. So, but the this is one area I feel, John, that the alternative media has really played a vital role in getting this message out and getting this information out. And you know that it's been effective because the public's perception of gun violence, of gun crime, and of you being allowed to defend yourself, your right to bear arms has totally changed over the last 30 years, more or less kind of starting out with your, your seminal research on, uh, you know, more guns, less crime, but it really kind of started a movement after that, didn't it? Well, you know, who knows what, uh, you know, what caused the changes and stuff like that. I know a little bit over 20 years ago, I wrote an op-ed for the Wall Street Journal about these types of gun-free zones. Uh, and at that time, uh, you know, even uh, gun groups like the NRA and what have you opposed you know, what I was saying with regard to schools and what have you, now you have 20 states that allow uh, teachers to be able to go and carry guns at school to varying degrees. Uh, you know, you have anything from places like Texas uh, and Ohio, which both have over 200 school districts as of this past spring, uh, allowing uh, teachers to carry to places like Utah and New Hampshire, where if you have Basically, if you have a concealed carry permit, uh, you're allowed to uh, you're allowed to go and carry uh, if you're a teacher in the state. Um, you know, in the Texas and Ohio and other states, you have to go and get uh, the approval of uh, uh, the state super, the school superintendent uh, to be able to go and carry, or the school board. Um, but you know, or you look, you have 12 states that mandate that uh, public universities allow people to carry if they have a uh, concealed handgun permit. Uh, 23 states leave it up to the individual school. I mean, those are big changes from from where we were 20 years ago. I mean, obviously, more needs to be changed because you have the attacks in those schools where people aren't allowed to defend themselves. There hasn't been any mass public shooting or even just a shooting of any type in any of the public schools that allow uh, teachers to carry or uh, universities that allow uh, students uh, and others to carry if they have a concealed handgun permit. Yeah, very true. So, you know, we found out a lot about the whole uh, Marjorie Stoneman high school shooting, Douglas Stoneman, whatever her name is, in Florida here. And we had good guys on the ground there with guns, and they didn't do anything, um, really. And then they blame it all on gun control. And, you know, there were so many warning signs. This is a monumental failure, gross negligence, putting it charitably, of all these law enforcement and school authorities never really uh, rising to, you know, never using common sense to protect these children and stopping this from happening in the first place, which it could have been done. FSN Radio. It's all about what's next. Egypt is on the verge once again becoming a world-renowned gold producer. The golden age is being rediscovered. For millennia, ancient Egyptian kingdoms prospered from unparalleled riches. Pharaohs built their empires and flaunted their abundant wealth that was made possible by the country's resource-rich gold deposits. Despite this rich history, modern Egypt remains one of the most underdeveloped gold mining countries in the world. Aton Resources is at the center of the modern Egyptian mining world, diligently working both as the only public ex exploration company in Egypt today and as the advocate for mining reform with the Egyptian government. 
However, those that arrive early like Aton will reap the best rewards. Aton's discovery of the legendary Lost Mountain of Gold at Rod Ruin and its current aggressive drilling program there could potentially reap those rewards. Aton Resources is focused on its 100% owned Abu Marawat concession in the Arabian Nubian Shield located 200 kilometers north of Sentiman Sakari's world-class gold mine. Aton possesses first mover advantage in the underfollowed jurisdiction of Egypt, which is currently undergoing mining reform. To stay on top of Aton's latest drill results and news, go to atonresources.com. Aton trades on the TSX-V under the ticker AAN and on the OTC under the ticker ANLBF. The Financial Survival Network. It's all about what's next. Yeah, look, um, you, you know, I it, it's a difficult job to be able to run into a place where you're having an attack and one can understand why people freeze. But if you had had, let's say, somebody who was being attacked, who was inside the classrooms or other places where the shooter was going uh, from place to place, you know, it's, it seems quite likely that they would have responded differently with the attacker coming at them rather than somebody having to run into a place. You know, um, presumably this killer uh, looked to see whether or not uh, any guards were present there before he engaged in his attack. And, uh, but, you know, if there were concealed handgun permits and the, and the attacker begins his attack, he reveals his position and he has to worry then whether there may be somebody behind him or to the side, uh, who may be able to go and stop him. And so that makes it riskier. You know, if you only believe the officer, uh, is the only one with a gun, then, you know, you can pull yours out and shoot him without having to worry about somebody else taking you out like that. And so it makes it riskier for the attacker to, to go after the officers first mm -hmm. and makes it less likely that they're going to do it. Very true. Very true. And hey, the other thing is that um, the truth is coming out now that the security, the high school never took security seriously. One of the guys who was there, unarmed security monitor, you know, it's literally, John, like that commercial where there's a bank robbery taking place and the guard is there and they said, why don't you do something? He said, oh, no, I'm not, I'm not a security guard. I'm a security monitor and I'm just here to monitor. And that's what this right. guy did. And, the, you know, the school security in the case of uh, the, the Parkland shooting uh, became kind of a dumping ground for people that they couldn't fire so they said, ah, they can't do much harm in school security. We'll throw them over there. And little lo and behold, uh, they did much more damage at school security than wherever they might have been before. Yeah, I mean, that's, unfortunately, that's been the story previously. You go all the way back to Columbine, for example. Uh, they had uh, one officer there at the school. But the reason why he had been assigned to the school kind of follows along exactly what you just said, that uh, this, that individual had completely failed uh, the firearms test. Uh, he had been unable to hit the target at 25 uh, feet. And so, uh, I mean, literally. And so uh, they figured, well, we'll assign him to a school because it's not really necessary for him to be able to shoot. Now, even though they put somebody there who was unable to shoot. He still saved lives because mm -hmm. um, he took a position kind of behind a corner in the hallway um, and engaged the attackers, uh, the two killers there for a while. The reason why he had to give up that position though, is that uh, uh, the two kill killers there had uh, brought homemade grenades and were throwing them down the hallway. Right. And uh, uh, the killer there just found, or the officer there just found defending his position there untenable and, and had to leave. But still, if you remember uh, the mm -hmm. pictures from that, uh, yes. you would see, remember seeing people getting out of the building through windows. Uh, and what happened was people were escaping and that additional five minutes allowed a lot of people to escape from the building uh, who otherwise wouldn't have been able to escape. So 
You know, who knows how many lives uh, were saved, even though uh, you had somebody there who wasn't uh, really competent at being able to fire a gun. It's ironic, isn't it? But still, his mere presence, those two, I think there was one in Kentucky where two uh, law enforcement, uh, two cops were shot there uh, trying to stop this guy. But, you know... They distracted him long enough. More cops came in. They were able to shut him down. So, so even. But I mean, there have been a few cases where officers have successfully mm-hmm. stopped these sure. attacks. It's just, uh, you know, it's just it's it's more difficult. It's riskier. I mean, mm-hmm. we should be thankful for these guys going and be willing to to yeah. have these types of jobs. I mean, one. Being an officer at a school is an incredibly boring job. Yeah. Uh, you know, these attacks are incredibly rare. Uh, and, you know, being on the job day after day, week after week, month after month. I mean, could you imagine being a guard like that at an yeah. elementary school? I mean, what are you going to be doing most of the rest of the time? It's not like you're going to be giving tickets to kids running down the hallway or something like that. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. you know, it's just very difficult. Uh, you know, in fact, if anything, maybe uh, schools, when they previously would have handled something with detention or something else, now they have an officer there at the school and they feel, well, we might as well use them or we should use them for something. So some things that yeah. used to be handled by the principal and disciplining a student now are handled with an arrest or something. Uh, mm-hmm. And, you know, that's just kind of understandable human nature that 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 change occurred but um but still being the officer there is very boring um you know i I just give you an example you look at something like the air marshals program uh the uh retention rate uh for six months is less than uh 50 percent uh you know you think well you know being able to fly across the world or whatever must be interesting but you know, you're not allowed to read a book. You're not allowed to look at a magazine. You can't watch a movie. You have to be vigilant all the time. Mm-hmm. Uh, you can't go to sleep. You know, just sitting in a seat, flying back and forth across the Atlantic, you know, is a pretty boring job. And, uh, you know, if anybody with much intelligence at all, they're not going to want to keep doing that for very long. Yeah, agreed. Agreed, for sure. Well, the fact is that in um, Broward County, Florida, and in Miami-Dade, and we go back to Trayvon Martin, we had this thing called the Promise Program, where they would basically allow uh, kids to commit crimes on the school premises without prosecution because they wanted to bring down the minority suspension expulsion rate and prosecution rate in these schools. This was Eric Holder's brainchild. So basically allowing disorder to take place in schools, the more disorderly a school is going to be, you got to figure the more likely it is for bad things, not just a potential shooter, but all sorts of other bad things, crimes, whatever to take place. And yet They've in, eff- effectively, John, encouraged bad behavior and disorder to take place in schools. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree with you. If you make it so that it's not costly, there, there's no repercussions for somebody going and doing something bad like that. You're going to see more of that uh, bad behavior occurring. Yeah, yeah, really unfortunate. And uh, hey, it must really be hard being a teacher in this situation. The last thing you ever really want to do as a teacher is carry a gun into the classroom. On the other hand, it might be the only means of protecting yourself and your students uh, should one of these situations arise. Yeah, well, I mean, uh, I mean that's exactly what we've been saying. So, uh, uh, you know, I'm not really sure what the alternative is that they'd like to have happen. Hey, and that brings me to the next thing. So I don't know if you heard, but in... Portland, Oregon, which is a hot seat of of crazy left wing violence, they want to. They might even be putting it on the ballot, a measure, or it's before the city council to uh, force police to not carry weapons. I mean, is this madness or what? 
Yeah. Well, um, <laughs> look, what uh, you, say? <laughs> you, you know, I'm not really sure what to say about that. I mean, obviously police have a difficult job. Uh, they're, they're, you know, they're motivated, they say, because they want to end police shootings, mm. uh, that occur. Also, uh, they think they can pay people less in that situation, uh, than it, one's officers that they have that carry guns. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, uh, one of the problems that you ha and this would be people responding to non-emergency calls, mm -hmm. but, uh, you know, how quickly an officer can arrive at a scene is very important in stopping crimes. I mean, not everybody's going to be able to go and defend themselves or not everybody does defend themselves. And, uh, you know, if you have a, a larger percentage of your officers, uh, are, unable to respond to those types of emergency calls, then you're going to have a slower response time to emergency calls, everything else equal than you would have had otherwise. Yeah. Is the car that may be nearest uh, to an, a, a crime that's occurring uh, may not have officers who are able to respond to those types of emergency calls. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Couldn't agree with you more. And you wonder like, okay, so... You know, and the main thing, the police union wants to represent these unarmed officers. And uh, the commissioner of the city says, no, they shouldn't be part of the police union. They don't do what policemen do. So they want to create a whole separate, effectively, division of security monitors. Because what else is a person going to do? Oh, call in, you know, hey, there's a shooting at such and such. Send the real police. I mean, it's it's kind of absurd. They're just spending money uh, on these people with uh, really little or no benefit accruing to it. So, you know, that's just type of the type of madness that's going on. Hey, so, John, uh, best place to find you is crime pre crime research dot org, crime prevention research center, and uh, it's always great having you on. Any questions or comments for John or myself, email us, kl at com. Twitter feed, at Carrie Lutz. Facebook page, Financial Survival Network. Hey, if you're listening on YouTube, please subscribe, like, and share. And if you're not listening on YouTube, share it anyway. People uh, really enjoy the show, really get something out of it, as I can tell from your emails. John, it's great to have you back on. We'll talk to you again real soon. Great talk to you, Carrie. Thanks very much. FSN Radio. It's all about what's next. Go to FinancialSurvivalNetwork.com and sign up for your free weekly newsletter. You'll also get three free reports. The Financial Survival Network. It's all about what's next.